The group here has three magnificent books on the railroad. This is by Jack Snyder, who lives at Ashley Place in Chapline's Choice. And the reason we have a really nice train station is Jack sat down with Senator Byrd and knew what he was talking about. He got all the restoration money. But this is one book on the B&O. There are three railroads that came through here. And then that's east-west. And then later in, uh, in the late 1880s, this is, here we go, <laughs> the Shenandoah Valley Railroad. This is the north-south through the county with a lot of local stops. You could sell your milk to more the next village down, down the road. But we're so fortunate to have three awesome books. And the third one is about our wonderful mystery man, uh, Sandy O. Winston Lake. O stands for Ogle, right? <laughs> this is a this is a real Christmas present. All of this magnificent. You saw them in the list of images that I sent to you. The ones that are O W L. And uh, this I, this is a great Christmas present. And this on the back. So I just want to let you know that there's some great resources, and I give them back to these people. And. <laughs> Now, the, and yeah, just just we're playing it easy. Then we're going to get serious. Uh, everyone at the last meeting, Kelly, knew me going on and on about this great book called Albion's Seed. Oh, here it is. And notice, <laughs> eight hundred pages. But how can you not like a book? Food way, four waves of British migration. Food ways, dress ways. Work ways, wealth ways, oh, sex ways, order ways. It's so each one is just broken down into their, the way they live. And we had two of them, which he calls backcountry and tidewater Virginians. Those are two of them. And then he doesn't do German, but if you figure out backcountry, and that's I, very specifically for us, it was Irish Presbyterians. Kind of like New Light Presbyterians. Uh, but this is a marvelous book. It's fun, okay? Uh, <laughs> whenever he says backcountry, I think of NASCAR and Dolly Parton <laughs> in Texas. <laughs> then he got all, suddenly you understand what we're meaning about national identity. Oh, that. Okay. And this. I gave it, I gave a show the, the Wani film. This is a presentation I gave way back in the, the late, uh, early 90s. Disappear in Railroad Blues. And it was about W.W. Wadi, the video you got. And he was the train, train station master for many, many years, like 1928 to 1955. And uh, we gave a presentation at the Shepherd Sound Opera House. I mean, not uh, Shepherd Sound train station. This is really about steam engines, the nostalgia of the steam engine. And we're not going to go into after 1960. OK. We're doing two things. I'm going to begin. Oh, you're first, Kelly. Kelly missed our Where My Family's Fun last week. And I asked her, and she graciously agreed to give her family's background, which we all did last week. How was it, Kelly? Uh, my background would be uh, primarily Scottish, Scott-Irish, English, and French. Um, my family's, um, from the best of our knowledge, we've traced it back. The latest came in before 1760. I actually had my connection to Shepherdstown as a grandfather that was born there in 1780. Our family primarily settled in what was Augusta, Orange County, Virginia, uh, and um, Garrett County, Maryland, that area, and then came west into West Virginia in 1905. And then I was born in 1960. That's essentially it. Pretty good. Where were you born in the county? <laughs> I was born in Randolph County. That's great. 
two of the people here, you're going to hear about your, your, your family history in a sense. Someone in your family is going to be in the story today. Okay. To Ellie and, and Sandy. I learned again, notice again, sometimes you have to learn again, the population in Jefferson County in 1830 was 14,000 people. The population, no, 1840, the population in Jefferson County in 1940 was 16,000 people. Incredible. But what that means is they are intermarrying like crazy. And like everybody knows that is related to everybody, but really tightly knit, okay? Then, of course, now it's it increased fourfold since then. But that's an interesting fact. So here's, the, here's what we want to say. Kelly, last week I was saying how unique we were at a Dennett garden of a fertile land, huge, easy game catch game. And it, it was a, it, a, a, you could live like a king on modest means is what somebody said within a cabin. You lived a subsistence living here in the, uh, from 17, 30 to about 1750, then there's wars, and then after the wars, it got peaceful again for about 40 years, up to 1820, but it was Eden. And here's my point. What we're doing today is two things. I've always contended that this is, into this Eden came people who were fiercely determined to have freedom. That's ingredient number two, religious land ownership. The Germans, Scott-Irish. And we're starting to create the, the recipe for our national identity. Now, here's, my, here's what I'm saying. A person can easily say, uh, Jim, aren't you kind of stretching this national birthplace of American identity thing? And, and you're right. But this is, this is going to be very moving, frankly. I have to keep getting choked up by this. Nobody shaped George Washington's person now self in his younger days more than the men from this area who we fought with the French and Indian War, who we grow up with, who was at Fred uh, Winchester, the ones he hanged for being drunk, all that, and grew up with him. Their incredible sacrifice and devotion to him in the revolution, especially at Valley Forge, is what started making him a great man. And I'm not exaggerating. So that's the, that's the thing. That's how essential these soldiers, these completely determined, you know, these guys who enlisted 447 from Jefferson County. The effect they had on the, him who became the the exemplar of what, what America is about, that's how we start becoming part of the birthplace of national identity. Okay, that, that's a big thing, because up till now you go, yeah, sure, right. From Tell me more, tell me more, Jim. Okay. We left the meeting last time. We're gonna do this point about George Washington, the character, the relationship, then get into railroads. Imagine this image. We're starting off this subsistence uh, lifestyle, Hardly any rules, but it's 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 paradise as long as you don't want a big Cadillac. But upon that, of all people, it'll be George Washington who will turn the the cycle of time forward progressively and start pulling it into the world's capitalist market system. And it's not that little isolated paradise of subsistence. Um, and that's the railroads, see? Paradise, and then you drop three railroads on it, and then you got it today. Here we go. You all remember, as I said in the email, who was the last person we were focusing on at the last class at the Washington meeting as men? He didn't think, will my buddies come? And here they came, 600 miles in 25 days. Liberty or death here on their bosses, don't tread on me, the coiled snake. This is attitude. This is why I freely call it all American ornery people. And, and Washington was so moved because they came. And when he saw them in the parade ground, he shook all their hands individually and just, oh my gosh, it's a real thing. Now, 
the war progresses. Think of these chapters that shape the, their relationship. It's now November 16, 1776, around the next year, he's got about 15,000 troops, George does. Still that core group. And they're, they're outnumbered massively at Fort Washington. Washington, who's so connected with his men, tells the Continental Congress, I believe we have to withdraw. And they said, no, you must fight. Yes, sir. They were slaughtered and Dansky Dandridge is known as the person who, who, who numbered this out. <clears throat> I'll, I'll save that. They take about 2,476 whatever prisoners, the British and the Hessians, mercenaries, Hessians. And, we, and, and Washington had some prisoners too. Washington's, because he's George Washington, fed them, sheltered them, made sure they were healthy, his prisoners. He already knew what human rights was. Now, we're following Daniel Morgan, who's buried right at the, up there at the old church, and two brothers, Daniel Henry and uh, Michael Benninger. Daniel is, stays home. Henry said, no, you're, you're only 16. You got to stay home with mom. Stay home with mom. You can't come. But he was the warrior. You can't keep him home. And this is the story. This is the best stories I've ever encountered here. But it's about this relationship. Daniel is right there in Fort Washington, shooting better than almost anybody, like 20 rounds off and all this in a short period of time. When he's supposed to be home with mom. He's taken prisoner. He's not an officer. So like Henry, he's billeted somewhere. But Daniel finds himself in lower Manhattan with the food he was supposed to be given was being sold by the commissary on the black market. And he was surviving by scraping sugar off the, um, the whiskey vats, getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And as the, as the people are getting weaker and all this, it's time for an exchange. And David Hackett Fisher won a Pulitzer Prize on a book about this, Liberty and Freedom. Again, this sounds funny. Washington, Washington cried when it met. It was real stuff. When he saw, he returned the British exchange. It was an exchange. He showed, returned his British all in good shape. And then he saw these guys who were skeletons, his men. Just think about it. He didn't even want the battle. The Hessians, and, and, and when this exchange occurred, where is Daniel Morgan? He's a bag of bones on the Jersey prisoner ship. And the Hessians come in, come in, and you know damn well, whoever they don't take out is going to die. And they're just picking people for who's healthy enough that they can get them to Washington and they're not going to drop over dead. And here's Daniel, and they, they go, they see him, they ignore it. He's not good, and he's going to die, forget it. They go by him again. Daniel, because he's got German blood, bitter, comrade, bitter, he speaks German. And they, and they have to lift him up. They, okay, whatever. So, the only reason he survived, but he's, he's just, they put him on a wagon, and somehow or other, it winds up. He winds up in a in a Jersey farmhouse in a barn. You know, it's worth how the military works. I don't know, but Washington just saw British in action. Of that twenty four hundred seventy six in in two, I think Dancy said two months and four days. Nineteen hundred died. 
Some were bayoneted and some just died. I mean, <laughs> these are our boys. Daniel is dying in a pile of straw in the corner of the farmhouse. Million and one. You know how the how world works, these incredible odds. Who comes walking into that barn? What are the odds? His brother Michael. And Michael kind of looks around. He shuffles around, looks at everybody. This is too hard to say. Well, I don't see anybody here that I know. This really weak voice. There is one in Michael. There is one. <laughs> he, he takes it, you know, think of, think of Dvorak's going home, right? He lifts up his brother who's just, he's, he's like, lost 50 pounds and what he does he busts up he busts up a chair gets some leather straps and creates like this hiking frame you know and puts they and they place daniel in it and they walk quite a way well yeah that's right they walk quite a ways and they make it a, a little ways and, and uh, they're tough and they find another place to rest. And a very nice Quaker family says, here, you stay and rest for a while, recover. And they do, I don't know how long. And then they continue their journey home, walking side by side to Shepherdstown slowly. Now, what kind of guy is Daniel better? As soon as he thought he was well enough, And fought for the whole war. That is what shaped that experience. George seeing his men treated that way, seeing that incredible determination in Daniel Benedict multiplied by hundreds. And then you find him at Valley Forge. That is where he became great. Again, the Continental Congress wouldn't give him money. The British, this is what he did believe in. This is where he believed in Alexander Hamilton. You know, Chernow doesn't quite understand one thing about Washington. He doesn't understand that military man thing. He's wrote some great books on great financiers. And he always thought that was the, how you understand George. I was born at West Point. I know that military thing. You know, you, if you're in the military, you know what I mean. Well, 2,500 died of starvation, they had no shoes in the winter. And George saw the British with cash. Everybody's glad to sell them stuff. That's when George said, you need a strong financial system to be a great country when you, where you can get the cash when you need it. He became a Hamiltonian unconsciously right there. And I'm so, I wish teachers would share that incredible quote that I should show you. I found out on Founders Archives, a letter to a friend. He said, history will note that these men in their nakedness in the wintertime, no shoes, you know, he explained the whole thing. He said, it, <laughs> it cannot be paralleled. My whole point, and it's easy to see, they're making him a great man just by being so loyal, incredibly self-sacrificing. So that makes the connection I wanted to share with you. This is, it sounded a little loose and shaky that this is the birthplace of something that's very American, the patriotism, but man, <laughs> see, he'd been with these guys since 1754, a lot of them. But the thing is he was so connected with them, he grew. So that sets the stage. I will just leave it there because it's just, it's such a hell of a story. If you go to the church, go back to behind the church itself, there's Daniel. You walk over here and you see Henry Bedinger. He, had, he wrote the diary. Michael, all the Bedingers were very bad with money. Do you know what? They broke on the subsistence economy. And he went to Kentucky. 
Okay. The railroad. George always wanted to find a way to connect the ports on the East Coast to the inland resources and farmer skills. They have to connect. He's always thinking the Potomac's the interstate that puts these two things that makes us a big country. Virginia was big, had a lot of land that way. And he did, George had a lot of land that way too. So there's a little economic angle. It's 1794. It's the, war, the revolution's over. The height Fairfax dispute is gone over for, for all the acres. There was like 20, 27 parcels in Jefferson County that were disputed. The point is, when all your plaintiffs, all your the parties of the suit die and a revolution moots it out, all the height people who bought land from Joe's height, their claims were good. And everything started booming. Uh, a man named Dr. Stewart did a report to Washington and said, this is the most fertile land in Virginia, Berkeley and Jefferson. He is president and they said, well, we now have to have a serious army. And he had the power to decide where an armory would be located other than Springfield, Mass. And all these people are saying here, how about five of them, how about one of them? How about North, how about South? How about more Springfield? And George said, Harper's Ferry, for the personal reason, but also he said, it's got incredible water power, right? Antietam Iron Works, pig iron. Uh, and a huge uh, German artisan uh, master, you know, good, incredibly master gunsmiths who were raised in the German apprentice system. Boy, did they. And you know, here at Shepherdstown, Sheets, Sheets was one, and then Welsh's. He knew that. The others didn't know intimately the other places. So, because he's George Washington, he says, "No, it's here. It's here. I don't care. It's here." And indirectly, the existence of that is why <laughs> the BNO decided to do a very interesting thing in 17, I mean, 1831, I mean, no, 1833 or four or five. They're running the B&O and, and, and from Baltimore West, all in Maryland. Many people had known by that time that Europe would pay top dollar for the flour that was grown and, and milled in Jefferson County. And, and all these beautiful manor homes that Johnny Allen said they were so special, right? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's wheat money from Europe. That's where all that affluence came from. And because unlike the rest of the valley that had good soil, we had the canal and now the railroad taking it to market. One little key thing, you know how one person shifts the whole thing? I'm really a fan of somebody called John Pendleton Kennedy. Uh, I haven't heard of him, but John Staley always say the three most important people from, from the panhandle in history are Charles Faulkner, David Hunter Strother, and John Pendleton Kennedy. No one's ever heard of him. Who is he? A very influential person in Baltimore politics, but here's why you like him. When Edgar Allan Poe didn't have a clean shirt, bought him a suit, he brought, bought him to dinner, became his savior basically, and got him the job, and that first real job he got. He basically pulled him out of the gutter. Good man. He also wrote a profoundly influential cultural book, 1831, called Swallow Barn. Now, he disguises it and makes it sound like it's on the, on the James River. It's the Bower. Why do we know? Because they're his relatives. And he'd go there every summer. And he'd soak up this eccentric, little isolated part of the world of colorful characters and sort of a thriftless gaiety is the way he put it. And he's slightly mocking them, you know? But what this little book was the one that started that whole uh, plantation literary tradition. And he's sarcastic, you know? 
He sees the, the foolishness of it, some of it. But that morphed and morphed and morphed and morphed until it became gone with the wind. But it's a very important, I love, I did a lot of research on it. And you, the more you count it up, you know who everybody is. He doesn't, almost doesn't hide it. So this is an interesting man. But here's what I'm saying. He said, he's, he said wait a minute. We're in a race now in the middle, early 18th. We're trying to get west and beat the CNO Canal. We're pushing through mountains and fighting about it. Did Harper's Ferry run a line in the Harper's Ferry, for God's sake, so you can pick up the little tiny Winchester Potomac Railroad, 1831, running from Harper's Ferry to Winchester? And you'll scoop up all of that produce and flour for the BO. They listened. That is so faithful. We would not be in West Virginia if they did not listen to John Pendleton Kennedy. Here's why. When the Civil War began, think of that being a real, it is profoundly important. Lincoln's a railroad man. Most people don't know this, but in 1862, Lincoln voted, passed, the, got the vote passed on the transatlantic track rail. He knew he was gonna settle the West with free states using the railroad. You can see it. You know, it's so obvious when you think of it. You're making sure the people who settled there are northern, don't like slavery, and all the Northwest Territory was not supposed to have slaves, but he wanted all of that to be populated quicker. So, so here, what, but, but however, because of John Pendleton Kennedy, the BO is moving west unfailingly. And when it came through this area, Jack Snyder got this nail down. But you know, in Duffields, there's still the stone portion of a depot there. And that was built in eight, uh, 1839 while they're running that part through. They ran to about 30 miles into Virginia and back into Maryland. Harpers Ferry, I think it's out at Cherry Glen. Along the way, that little building, if you ever see it, and we've saved it, it's, this is a mouthful, but Jack said, it is the oldest, Surviving, of course, I love this phrase, purposed commercial and freight station in, in B&O. B&O is huge now. And so Jim, where is this building in, in relation to like the platform? Go to the, uh, go to the, if you go from Shepherdstown and you're coming to the track, go left on, on this little side road this way. I don't know what it's called, Kidwiler? Mm -hmm. Disco French. Yeah. Is it French? No. I forget the name of Duffield's There's, like, There's like a little store up there and it's yes, like yes. The, yes. The and they drink the they, you make a left there. Right? You make a left there. Yeah, and right there at the little store before the track. Yes. And, and if I you just to me crazy. Yeah, if you exactly. Yeah. And if you if you look in a book there, there's been a drawing of that that little store from 1864. Always playing um, on the a drawing of the building. It's just a little further down. And somebody have a question? Okay. But you'll see, the wooden part fell apart. And I, I sent everybody the image of the drawing from 1864. But the key thing is they go this number of miles into in 1861 was going to become a hostile foreign power. Now you know what's, where we're going with this. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is where, oh, good. I'm glad you're back here. This is when it gets really fun. You know, Stonewall Jackson is definitely one of the most humorless people that history ever provided us. And if he's funny, he didn't intend to. His sister said, You will find there is not one person in a million like my brother. He, this is very key. One of those overlooked things that they just pulls my hair out, the historians skip by things. Virginia did not want to secede. They voted for the man for president November 60s who did not want to secede. He wanted to just say, stay in the, stay in the union, gain the constitution, John Bell. Jefferson kind of way big for John Bell. This is, to, I'll, I'll be, I'm making a point, it'll be real quick. The point is, 
Stonewall, after a April 18, he had, a, he had a growing number of men who he began drilling from Bolivar Heights from April 18 to 1861. And he's not fighting. It's really interesting. He just, soon as 8,000 men, even from Mississippi, but they're not fighting. You know why? May 23rd, the magic Historians never tell you. It was a coup what happened. Preston Smith, one of the heavyweights in Charles, Charles, South Carolina, who really forced this, said, you, Virginia will never secede. You have to make them. You know what they did? You shoot at a Union vessel at Fort Sumter. That easy. And I think it was Edwin Ruffin, right? That's, and then poor Virginia knows they're, they're between a rock and a hard place. You know what that one shot fire did? Our people, our delegates to the Virginia Secession Convention, I'll be real quick, but this is so important. Why Jackson's not shooting a gun until May 23rd. We're stealing trains, that's the more relevant point. The vote in April 4th, 1861 by all these delegates was a strong majority, majority don't secede. April 18th, enough to secede. And Governor Wise is raised, raising, waving a gun. Other guys are stalking the halls of the hotels with lynch rope. It was, it was a coup. And even before the vote was finalized, Turner Ashby and Emmett and these others are, are making their way to capture the arms at Harper's Ferry. The ink hadn't even dropped. I'll bet they did not even know that it was amended because it said, pending a referendum on May 23rd. So it was cool what they're doing. All right. So if this is now, now, now this is fun. This is for once, Jackson is a funny man. He's like this. And all during the period when he couldn't fight. He sent these telegrams to Mr. Garrett, the president of the BNO. I jokingly like to say it's like an email. S. Jackson at confed.mil.gov <laughs> <laughs> to RW Garrick at BNO.com. Mr. Garrett, because of the trains on your double track from Harpers Ferry, you know, west, uh, their noise, my men cannot sleep at night. Could you reschedule? And he goes, mm, 8,000 men, okay. And, let, and Jackson lets a little time go by and he says, another telegram from uh, R. Garrett from S. Jackson, Convo. Uh, would you please reschedule for another reason? The men, the train's going the other way, east, because they cannot hear our drill orders because of the train whistles. And Garrett has no choice, really. But what Jackson was doing, <laughs> this is really funny. He made sure that John Imaden said this. He said, it got such that there was no trains on the track every, any time of day, except for 11 to one, when the double track and the were the busiest railroad in America. <laughs> 11 to one, and Jackson said, okay. Referendum passed. Ashby, drop a rock on the tracks. All the trains are this side of the rock going west. And then we have all the trains that are already in Martinsburg about to go east. They're not going east. He captured 386 coal, 386 coal car gondolas. And I think it's the number of barriers, I think it's 20. All locomotives. Garrett knew which side he was on now. <laughs> but yes, it's kind of amusing, isn't it? No one's hurt. Clever. Very clever. You know, so now there's one other point, and then we're going to move on. It's, it's a good story. The videos are all about it. You do not want to work for Stonewall Jacks. But there was a man who worked for him, who had a job to do after what do you do with all these trains? And his name is Sharp, and thank God his diary is online. But when the war, just to know that when the war ended, 
he was in Garrett's office and thesis finished. And basically when you can just see Garrett kind of not listening, he says, sir, my name is Mr. Garrett, uh, Mr. Sharp. And, and you can just see Garrett going, you're, you're Sharp? You did that? A big job, got a big job. It's because Sharp was in Martinsburg with Jackson and said, sir, we've got 21 locomotives, 380 car, six coal car. What do we do with it? And you can just see Jackson eating on an orange. He always did that. He, he loved fruit. Take him to Strasburg. And you can just see Sharp going, with all due respect, sir, there is no track to Strasburg. <laughs> And, and Jackson is, yeah, take him to Strasbourg. This is the boss you, you admire but hate. <laughs> and what he did was, I have it all in the video, got it all figured out, but he had like he had like 10 horse teams, you know, just a massive number of uh, pulling, and they had uh, uh, massive logs that are kind of rolled, they're rolling down along, pulling that way. This is, I, is Strasser about 30 miles from Martinsburg, something like that? And uh, I think only three didn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> where there's rotten old locomotives along the road. And they did one other thing. They, they, I don't quite understand mechanically, but there's a way when you reach an incline, you, you could put the brakes into place. There's a way of breaking it. So we, we're not engineers, but this sharp was one. <laughs> it's impressive. So during the Civil War, this whole system is running, going through our county, and so all the supplies are going back and forth. If you're a black man named John Fox who worked at the Bower, he became he owned three farms after the war. We're going to talk about it. He farmed in, in like those little huts in Carneysville was like a black community. He lived there, and there was a farm of Philip Dandridge of the Dandridge family right there, where kind of where Rockwell was, and it had timber and corn. But Bertha Fox Jones, who's direct descendant of his, told me, I said, Did you know anything about whether he did anything with the Underground Railroad or anything? She has this wonderful ancient accent. She said, Yes. He put them on the boxcar and cover them up with hay. It's <laughs> nothing, no more said. Just put the hay on them and there we go. And remember, it's gonna go back into Maryland later. And for a long time, I couldn't figure this all out when I realized that John Fox is not working at the proper main bar farm. He's at this, uh, a brother's farm, which is where the trains stop to get water. Suddenly it makes all the sense in the world. There's no trains near the bar, but that, there it is. The farmers, like the millers, there is so much moving around that their wheat crop is ruined. The ground is so compacted, everybody reverted to apple slater. Okay. I'm sorry. We'll just say I didn't, we didn't do anything else during the war. Uh, of course, the war ends. If you look at the census, massive shift from farmer to employee for the railroad or being a sore clerk. Complete, you kind of get off the farm. And it was, it was a very hard period. After any war, you see about 20 or 30 years of just going nowhere. Around 1880, the uh, farmer's Dr. Border, Daniel Border in Carneysville. Some of you might remember that beautiful house that unfortunately burned down across from the little white church in Carneysville. That was Border's home. He got the bright idea of growing apples. And remember how I said the railroad giveth and taketh away? Well, it, it giveth when it took the, the, the flower to Europe and brought back top dollar. But then it taketh away. From 1880 to like 1920, where they're all through there. No, no, right up to about 1940. Um, <clears throat> Sandy, and some of you guys know that uh, Huntfield, that, that place, that was Harry Bird's farm, uh, apple orchard, 
and, and, the, and the Apple experts told me that for quite a while, it was the largest continuous red delicious apple orchard in the world. So whatever happens. But it was very profitable to grow the apples. And anybody who grew up here knows about how everybody was in the apples. You know, after school, I could see say after school, everybody's in the apples during the harvest time getting the crop in. And so that was what life was like. Um, but two little things, you know, taketh away. Uh, ironically, one of the Washingtons, and I sent you a picture of Nathaniel Washington Willis, or Willis Washington. He gave up, he, he, he was at Rock Hall. I, I'm a, so many of the Washingtons that always hated slavery just took off. And where do they move? Washington. <laughs> It did. He goes out there and he's got a lot of influence. He's sharp. And wouldn't you know, we're, we're going like gangbusters. The biggest producer of apple in the United States was this Franklin County, right in this region. Musselman's in Martinsburg, right? Uh, as you all know, who grew up here. And, but they want to build a dam in Washington called the Grand Coulee Dam. It's going to create all this wonderful fertile land for lousy apples. <laughs> I'm being biased, but who, who can eat those thick skinned, tasteless, crumbly, red, delicious? I don't know. We like the stamens, the golden delicious. You know, we, we know that. Well, the railroad taketh away because you got a break, a, like a distance break for long haul, paid less. And we started losing our, our dominance. It became more and more us just uh, getting a, a regional market. That lasted into the 40s or 50s. It taketh away. And I don't want to lose this, this, this sequence here. Mr. W.W. W. Waddy, that is such a wonderful family. You think he invented the internet with WWW. And and family, and we did we did this as I showed you. And every day, he was well. He's on the Shenandoah Valley Railroad. Let's let's be real clear. We're staying in sequence. B and O east to west goes you know goes west and becomes huge. And then around 1880, of course, railroads are in the in the air. The Shenandoah Valley Railroad, which is all. Winston Link's favorite is goes from, I don't know, way down in Virginia, you, you know, I don't, up to Hagerstown, and then from there you can catch a train anywhere like New York. It's a great local passenger and freight train where you're, you're, you can sell your milk to the village down, down the line at the next stop, you just expand your local market. And it was, a, it was like, it was, it was still speaking to that subsistence local economy. And uh, somebody said that, um, I, I talked to his children. You, there was an old saying that if you, if you took a, damn, what's that seed? If you got steam, a soot in your eyes, a caraway, there's a certain seed. They said, put it in your eye and it'll push all that stuff out. I don't know. Or you go to Hagerstown and get a baseball bat like that. And I, uh, Mr. Waddy was the symbol of it. And he would live up on New Street where Steve Ibrod lives. And, and every morning he'd go down, you know, do the walk in, into the train station. Morning, Mr. Waddy. Morning, son. Good morning, kids. And he goes around the corner there. And right at the corner where Chris Crawford and, and Lori live, I was told that Mrs. Turner was in there. And they used to say that he had a big gold waffle watch. You know? She's on time. And she said, as soon as I saw the shadow of Mr. Waddy <laughs> go by my, my, door, my window and make sure my time was right, my clock was right. And he'd go there and he was a symbol of it. You're a kid, you had a couple of jobs. One of them was grab all the coal that bounces off the train. Mm -hmm. you know, good job. And the kids learn how to make, uh, it goes on and on like that. And Mr. Waddy was God, you know. The other thing that it did with kids, and this is what happened to R.J. Funkhouser. He was born in Cherry Run, and he saw the trains. 
you know, working family. He yeah, became a centimillionaire in the 40s. 10 companies, the office on Park Avenue. Own, lived at Claymont. Okay. He's in another night. Another day. Every time you're a kid and this train comes in, steam engines, they're so romantic. And this conductor would step off with all this braid and everything and put the little stool down. And this was a kind of time where, where um, came on the train, everything, who cares, a car, you know, everything you bought, coffins, you, you get the coffins, everything was on the train, life itself. But as a kid, this mysterious man with an elaborate uniform, he was like a symbol of the world's beyond where you want to be. That's not this boring little town. You want to follow that train and follow that dream. That's what happened to every young person. Follow that train. And so all of this romance builds up around the train. It's going to take you somewhere. And you know what somebody said? <laughs> she took it all to be. He said, you know what the sound of that train means at night when you're a little kid in bed? It means life can be better. Uh -huh. Yes? Can I hear you? She's okay. just agreeing. Okay. But you got the romance. I think we're almost finished. Oh my God. Remember now that when the when the trucks came, when vehicles came like the 1920s, it was another blow to the local trains because they could take it to market anytime you'd have to wait for the train. They could deliver product locally faster. So that's another blow to the romance of the train. And I found out that uh, I, was, I saw a good documentary about the Shenandoah Valley Railroad. They, they employed, oh, it's in the Owen Blink, Owen Link video. They employed thousands of people. They're the descendants of those master craftsmen, the hand skills. But Shenandoah Valley, just like the whole system we've got of lending and expanding and scaling up and laying off. It was far, far cheaper, easier, and more profitable to go off steam and go to diesel. Mm -hmm. And it's not the thing anymore. And this is what's so touching. If you saw the Wadi movie, he, you know, his wife, you could tell she ran things. It's really obvious. You know. um, and the son told me this, they were getting old. And this is just what happened in the space of like two years. I don't name, maiden name is Blackford, but she, she falls ill, she's old and, and, and she, she passes. Passenger service on the Shenandoah Valley ends. Steam engines end. And right after his wife died, Mr. Waddy looked at his wife and put his hand on her. He says, Hope you're darling. I'll be along shortly. He died of a heart attack in a week. So with the steam engine came the end of the Waddies, came the end of the time, came the end of that romantic period, which we're so thankful that. Oh, Winston Link has managed to capture it in his book. I'm done. Oh, no. You, well. No, we can talk now. Oh, okay. I well, could add a ton more, but I, I talk fast. <laughs> do you want to go to the, the photos? Yeah, let's take some questions and then you could, but anything, but we can, we can have fun with the photos. Do you have any, anybody have any comments? But you see how the trains are just for the backbone of life. I, I'm looking at Sandy and, and, and Kelly because you know about growing up here. Yes. Does that ring true with, with you at all? Absolutely for me. Even into the central part of West Virginia, trains were everything. Oh, you know, you know what? You, you gave me a chance to put in something I forgot. Okay. Kelly and Sandy. 
we had a train, we had a track laid for the train station. We had two, we had two stops in Shepherdstown. One was the freight, one was passenger. Today we know about passenger. Here's what happened. We all wonder when you look at the Potomac, why are there piers and why is there another set of piers that aren't, that aren't used? When they first built the, the, uh, the train lo track location, and if you look real closely, you can see the outlines of it. You know, uh, it's a back alley and it's back like that. Well, when the apples or when, yeah, that's, well, poke, no, no, no. Coal from Pocahontas County was huge shipments now. And they're to a big haul, a big weight. And Mr. Potts, who designed the thing, he looked at Pope Deacon, they realized that it, the track that had too much of a curve and too much of a grade to pull all of that up to Sharpsburg. You know, <laughs> like, but who knew? Who knew? Maybe they should have known. And that's why you, there's even great pictures of them dismantling the, uh, the superstructure of that river crossing because they had to move it further over with less curve and less incline. And that's why you got two of them. So that's a neat little thing I forgot to say. Any other comments? San Sandy, are you, are you there? Are you interested? Well, I mean, do you have any, anything to say? I, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the documentary about O. Winston Link when um, the, the um, railroad that he, he spoke of and he had wanted to buy and he, he wasn't able to is now the Virginia Creeper Bike Trail. And I didn't know about Winston Link, even though we're related. And um, my husband and I went to Abingdon, Virginia, and were riding on the um, on the Virginia Creeper Bike Trail and stopped at Green Cove. And that's the first time I ever heard of O. Winston Link because there they had an exhibit of his work. And then in the documentary, it says that he married there. So, um, so I found that really interesting, particularly because of him being an ancestor and, how, and his love of the railroad. And my husband worked on the railroad too. So there were a couple connections there. But uh, you know, when I was floored, you know, he's buried in, not by accident in uh, Elmwood. And, I, and I, we don't want to go into it, but he married the wrong person, putting it mildly. <laughs> you know, what, and what I'm saying, I hate to tarnish. When you see the video, he's obviously a good man. And I'm not going to tarnish him with that bitch. <laughs> she was so bad. Do you know how bad she was? Five years. She got five years for fraud. Twice. 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 No, the bitch, Twice. bitches are understatement. <laughs> And then, and then when she got out, and they said, and they got out and then went back. Would well, you remember when they said, what happened to the thousand prints you took? And she said, there are no thousand prints. Mm -hmm. Oh, so poor. So we just, bless his heart. <laughs> you can tell you I've never thought about money. Anyway, yeah. but that's why, what I'm getting at, it's very touching. You can see when all things happen, he's no longer a New Yorker. He comes back to the fold. And of course, <laughs> it never left him. You know, so we can talk about him, but the video is a beautiful, does a lot of the work for us. And I just was completely enchanted. Let's turn this over just a second. I mean, how perfect is that? That is so 50s. I know that I wasn't the only one that bought 10 packs of baseball cards at Williston and Falls Church and had a big wad of ink in here. That's so 50s, the little jacket, the, little, the jackets with the little fur collar. <laughs> wow. this, yeah. hey, comment, did it? Isn't that a beautiful photograph? And, and yes. the book, and I recommend, can I have the book? This book, as I said, this book is a great Christmas present. It, it, this is about, it has that, it has the before after. It shows that today. Oh, it's so, it's touching. Thank you, O. Winston. Okay, that's back up. Uh, let's, let's just kind of look at the photographs, the general group, and see if anything, anything interests us. You know, there's a picture of Nathaniel Willis 
In your email, you have an image of Daniel Bettinger. By the way, what do you do when you, wait, let's make up my stomach again. <laughs> <laughs> Featuring Jim's stomach. Um, somebody understood, yeah, let's just show them what became of Daniel Bettinger. He became the supervisor of the Norfolk Naval Yard. I think that's not right. And his home, Bedford, which was burned down in 1864 by General Hunter, because the resident was the first cousin of Robert E. Lee. But the columns were taken from the mast of the USS Constitution that were at Bedford. So that's, that's where he wound up. But isn't that romantic? Look. I, I bailed hay before, and I remember once I was pulling the hay up onto the wagon. I, I said, when I was in New York City wearing a business suit, I never dreamed I'd be doing this. <laughs> Let's see some others. Isn't that glory? That's in the book. Can you share this with them? Okay. Here we go. Good. Let's just we're gonna let's go through the photos. Oh yeah. You know, oh, Winston Link captured a time, and we're so thankful for that. But now you're going, how much is that dog in the window? <laughs> Those of our, of our age group. Now, this is, this is probably his most famous. And what a, and, and, and the, the patience it took to get everything right. You know, that had all the major elements in it. See, the drive out, the drive and make out, <laughs> the train, the, the plane. Oh, God. I've got some wonderful little color video of him going to Shenandoah Downs in 1959. And what is the music? Theme from a summer place. So there it is. If you heard it, you probably heard him say in the video, I can control my lighting precisely at night. You see, that's the, but it it's it makes it very um, why is it attract what is it draw what is what how what does it appeal to us? It seems surreal, of course. I think because it's hard and soft at the same time. Hard and soft, yeah. You know, it's the kind of the romantic uh, along with the industrial age. Yeah. Yep. And the plane is weird too. That's an interesting <laughs> little accent, you know, like an exclamation point or question mark. I don't know. You know, I, well, you know what? He could not cut and paste and, and, and no. put, you know, he somehow had to have the train in the plane. He might have begged them to freeze, stop to fight. He might have done that. He, did, yeah. you, did you hear me had the organist play that thing for 40 minutes until the train yeah. left? Right. He had enormous patience, I think. Sure did. That's the only way you get great art. So that's that's the one we all talk about. No, they're going well. The strange thing because of this misadventure is a nice, pleasant word about his marriage and wife. Um, they raise the value of his photos a lot. So there's there's a little uh, silver lining in the storm. What else we got? Yeah, let's do the full and then. Uh, and I love it. You definitely know that he has a certain plan. <laughs> There's only one way this is going to happen, buddy. Remember in the video how they talked about the wattage that came out of those lights? A huge amount. And that they don't use them anymore. So, you know, what you, what you see there is what you get. Yeah, and I think he, he fabricated a lot of the stuff. He's just, you, know, you, lo you love that artist that just is going to be themselves all the way. They, they do great things. And you can, you can go up and see a stone anytime and reflect on what he did. Okay, let's do another. That's the fourth. That's the fourth. Yeah. Okay, well, that's all right. Uh, let's, what we're going to do now is uh, let's talk, huh? These first two, 
uh, classes were st highly structured. Right, where, where are we going here? I'm at now, now I'm at, here's your chance to ask questions about last week or about the links, images. I didn't push y'all right up to the last minute. One thing I want you to know is this, these two are very structured. They kind of set it. And you know what? It was just this morning that I realized the point that I made that we had interesting patriots here, but it was that thing that transferred something with George, which became what he is, is that how we tie it to national history. Um, we're gonna, in the next week's, I, I'm trying to figure out what to do next, but just to let you know, Sandy and, and Kelly will know some of these people. I'm gonna do, I have a long, interesting list of people. Most people don't know that the original, really first lady, Harper's Weekly has a big drawing of her saying the original, the first lady, was the niece of James Buchanan. And she is so a lover. She, and, and, and we're gonna, I did a lot about her. She had, she had four uncles, uh, tons of family in Shepherdstown and Charlestown. And her, her family, uh, her uncles, oh my God, they owned, forget the Washingtons, they owned all of downtown. They owned, they owned a couple of blocks of homes on Washington Street. They owned all the land up Samuel Street. And, wow. and uh, who's there? It's oh. I'm on mute. Okay. I'm listening to you. Oh, I was just saying, wow. Well, no, see. My great thrill is finding out stuff that's really important that no one ever told us. And let me just, uh, since uh, she is great. What's, she just, what's her name again? Okay, I'll give you a quick flash on her. I have so many wonderful people to tell you about it. And, and I'll just say one category is called strong, smart, good women. <laughs> and there's five, Miss Violet, Miss Nina, Daisy Fritz, who ran the poor farm, Mom Wheeler, who ran the uh, children's haven. And then you can, you can throw in Julia Davis Adams and a whole bunch of people. But there's one, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Miss Violet, Miss Nina from Shepherdson. But there are so many people, uh, uh, the businessmen, we did that. I found out, uh, well, we're just, I, we have so many good people to do, but the categories are uh, and entrepreneurs, game changers is another category. Uh, the women I described, and then I, you know, we're going to have fun. But these first two, I had to structure it. We got to do, we got to, but the, the ones I went really deep on uh, in my last few videos were, um, I'm getting there, you know, my brain's slow. Charles Broadway Rouse is an incredible story. It's not the story you're generally told from who was, became incredibly wealthy and he wrote all his newsletters in phonetic language. I mean, he, and, and he was going blind. I'm just, damn, I'm, they're all so interesting. I'm just going back to Harriet, okay? Going back to Harriet. I have to say that I'm reading his obituary. We're going to Harriet, I swear. But Broadway Ross dies and when, when I'm, and I saw it as obit in the New York Times. And I never knew any of that. He was going blind and he, he put up a million dollars, period money, to anybody who could cure his blindness. Now, you know, you're gonna meet an interesting sub, subclass of the population that way. One of them was a guy who claimed to be the overlooked king of England, but so Harriet Lane Buchanan, it's his, Whenever they talk about James Buchanan, her uncle, worst president in America, blah, 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 blah. Let's be honest. He, he had, there was nothing he could do. The war was coming. You know, he, he, you know, either you declare war or you don't. Harriet was his niece. Grew up in Mercersburg. I got an email from a guy who bought her parents' home. He's making it into a B&B. 
And he said, your videos are the most comprehensive account. Harriet was this, right off the bat, both her parents died and she just says, I want to live with Uncle James. Just he picks out who she's going to go to. And there's, and what's so neat is she's got a mind of her own and he puts her at the Georgetown uh, Catholic School. She gets lots of values there. She's a smart, smart, interesting person and charming. She just blew him away in England. Prince, Prince of Wales got blown away. <laughs> what is so interesting is Buchanan, when he was all part of the Washington political scene, and all the men are, you know how they, the women always repair the next room and, and the men would talk shop? He let Harriet sit in with the guys. So this is what's interesting. You know, and he, he, this is a story. And look, we're not going to say whether Buchanan's gay or not, but he had a, he lived with one of the congressmen for years. And, you know, we, we don't want, it's not a point, not the point, but he, he had this wonderful sense of her. He, and she became special. They go, to, they go to England, and I, if you're a researcher, can you imagine my delight when I find when she lands in Liverpool, he's, an, oh, he's first the ambassador to England, and that's when they get to know Victoria really well, and Prince Albert. <clears throat> who meets him? Who meets Harriet, who came alone? But Nathaniel Hawthorne, who writes a perfect description of her. Now, I mean, this is a researcher's dream, and he, he nails her perfectly. She seems very self-confident. Then she goes, no, she's only like 19. Then she goes to the lectures, all, 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 all those stuffed shirts guys. <laughs> and she, she wrote these scathing critiques. They're so long, you didn't say a thing, you know. You just love her. She's no doubt in her mind about things. And, and she just critiqued the hell out of it. But you can see these stuff shirts who don't know they're not very intelligent, right? It's, you know, not really saying anything. And then this is what's so fun. See, the, this is going to be a series. This is going to be a PBS or something like that. It's made for Victoria is only a few years older than her. See, they're pals. And, and she meets Victoria, and don't they click like this, you know, thing because because Harriet is just Harriet, and she's got they always said she when she went to any reception, she every hair was in place, everything was perfect. She was delightful, restrained, funny, sharp. She just like was born to this. She was doing much better than her. Uh, obviously, we're talking about it now, uh, but that's what my lectures are like. There's a moment when Buchanan is getting an award at Oxford. And these, these young men were, are known to howl and hiss and boo. They express what they feel. And, you know, Buchanan always was a little, little you know, he showed up in front of the queen with not the proper full thing, you know. You know. Well, the story is, and once again, another home run I found is written by a teacher from in New Jersey, the eyewitness, that when they announced him to receive the award, it was just cat calls. The guy, yeah, and then, then they mentioned Harriet, and <sighs> she was hot, you know. And no, but she's so cool. Do you know why she's cool? Uh, after the, afterwards, she, she founded the uh, um, Helen, Helen uh, Buchanan Johnson Clinic for Children at St. John's, uh, St. John's Hospital, Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Hospital. She founded St. Albans, okay? This is a person with a lot of signs. And she had a so-so collection of art. And there was no national gallery yet. And there was some kind of stipulation in this, these, they're being stored somewhere, but she started the discussion to begin and build a national gallery mm -hmm. using her. This, and she was very big on Native Americans in 1850. Oh, what a fascinating, it makes you proud, you know? The family was so, she actually held the deed to, not the sweet shop, but the, the Judy Shepherds. I mean, Harriet had, had her name on that, 
And she had a name on a house that was uh, kind of bumped up next to Meadow, Meadowbrook. But, but her family, was, she even went to school in Charlestown. But I'll say one more thing. Remember I said Buchanan was, everyone just, oh, the worst. And you wonder why, you know, he was bland, but he wasn't, he didn't do anything disastrous, you know, I mean, he really was stuck. The town, the country divided. And he was, but here's the thing. The historians just pour through the official documents and they won't understand, and this is what they miss. He got along, he and Harriet, got along tremendously with the queen and Prince Albert, just fantastically. And then he comes back, and, this is, and then he's president. This is really important. And by the way, if you want to hear, see a great, great comment, you have to understand the, uh, does anyone know about the Crystal Palace Exposition of 1851? Changed the world. First World's Fair, Everybody thought Americans were idiots until that. And there's the McCormick's Reaper. There's a uh, Matthew Brady. There's John Hall's interchangeable parts. There's this guy who cracked up any lock, had a thing that cracked any lock in the world. Uh, and everybody, God, that was when everyone knew Americans were good engineers. But all during that period, okay. Albert was a visionary, but here. It's November 60. James Buchanan says, I understand that the prince is taking a tour to Canada. We would be, we'd love to see him come down to see us in Washington. Remember when this is, it's October really, October 1860, about a few hiccups away from a profound election. And he goes from New Richmond and he couldn't wait to get out of there, but he went from like 20 cities. Now, you could speculate like crazy about Harriet and the young prince when they come to Washington. If you know who Bertie was later on in life, you know, Victoria accused him of, of killing her husband because he went to a prostitute. Interesting family, kind of like today. You know? So, but here's my point. They come and there's a special day where they all, the English and prince who's never been First of his by a prince, they go to Mount Vernon. And, and you know what? The, the, the vessel they come on from, from Washington is called the Harriet Lane, the Harriet Lane Johnson. No, it's called the Harriet Lane. It's, it's named after her. And she's the kind of girl or woman who once tried to invite hundreds of people in Washington to come to a party on the boat without telling her president's uncle. You know, you gotta love her. No, no, it's not, no, no, you don't do that. You love her. But she spent the day with the prince. And for once in his life, there's no one watching him. And they went bowling. You know, it must have been, you can make a movie of this. And she, she's always competitive. And, and he's, he's, they say, said he's so happy because there's no one sitting on him. He's just delighted. I'm not gonna say a thing, but she, shows where his bedroom was in the White House. She knew where he was and is like way off in the corner. They had a terrific time together. I won't say any more. The port historical point, uh, this is really important. Historians totally miss it. When, when the, the, the prince came home and just said how much fun he had and Victoria writes Buchanan, this is what happens. You can't say it was, we had such a wonderful time with, you know, like that. And she said, I, I am determined that we shall always be allies as countries. I mean, it, we will always remain friends. Then, just right after Lincoln's elected, it's like May, all the press was profoundly just the overwhelming poll of the press wanted to decide the South. I didn't know that until I found a, a PhD on that. Like, like six to one wanted to decide with the South because the cotton in the mills. Victoria said, we're neutral. We're neutral against overwhelming, um, you know, Palmerston was a, 
Oh, you hate Palmerston. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, because the British really were not our friends in many, many, many ways, especially economically. Yeah. I mean, their whole model was to take uh, natural resources from a country, you know, like ours, and then uh, upvalue it with manufactured goods. Mm. And uh, the bankers who ran everything in Britain and New York for so many years uh, were certainly anti Hamilton. And uh, did not like Hamilton uh, because Hamilton realized in order to really make a great country, you need to manufacture. Mm -hmm. But the Brits model for empire was exactly the opposite. Yeah. And so I did not realize, like I did not realize, well, they didn't think it was exploitation necessarily. <laughs> they had another view. Yeah, they had a little another view. They, yeah, they, view. they were just better than everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And so they'd make better goods out of raw materials. But but I think uh, I did region. not realize that Victoria uh, really was the uh, intermontier of neutrality yeah. in that war because the uh, certainly that country, as you pointed out, uh, with, with, with these other folks would much rather have any side of the South. It was it was yeah. a common interesting. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, so and we can't never conjecture, but there she is. She's kind yeah, of she I, did not, I did not know. And, and historians have to take take account. And so Buchanan really wasn't uh, that's a whole nother view, really, when you think about it, how much influence they had and like Johnson did on her. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You you can a researcher can read the newspapers and you I used to be a journalist. You have to understand. You have to read personal letters. Yeah. You need eyewitness I accounts know. and personal letters because because journalists are always choosing to be a part of a certain narrative and so on. For, for example, Horace Greeley. You think he's enormously important and enormously great. He was highly influential at the Herald Tribune, but right after the war, he just he was nobody because he just was a big mouth. You know. But, but you got to look at the personal letters. Anybody? Questions? I have a question about the, the railroad stations. Um, I, I was, uh, when we moved here, for some reason, I just connected that it was Shepherdstown, there was, there was a train, there was a, a station. And so I assumed that the train would stop there. <laughs> and so I'm curious as to how Duffield's was chosen, if you know. And, well, you know, uh, and, and you. Charlestown didn't get it. Thank you. Here we go. You know? Okay, well, B&O East West, it goes to Duffield's. Okay. Shenandoah Valley is north south. Oh. Didn't have a stop there. However, in the 1980s, I'm interviewing George Canode, about 92 years old, Bill Canode's grandfather. And he said, you know, he was the principal of the elementary school in 1910, but he said, uh, if you told me that there, he said, I always believed that Shenandoah Junction would become this enormous railroad hub. Because here's, here's this one, this. Yeah. He said, if, you, if, if, if it didn't, then I'd be a, a darn fool, but they didn't have enough water for steam engines to, re, you know, to give them the water. It wasn't a big aquifer near it. So we couldn't become a jerk water town. <laughs> <laughs> so Shenandoah Junction, you're talking about where, what's the name of that road that goes across the, or is it down in that little town part? More? It's behind the high school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, but, there's yeah. both spurs that are coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, they, they don't quite, yeah, they don't, they just, they come near each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> So what's what comes through now? Come what what I mean? That's we, freight. See, they're making yeah. the railroad are making tons of money, just tons and tons of freight stacked too high. Yeah. Right. It also seems like there's a lot of coal. So which yeah. <laughs> do you think not? Of course. Yeah. But where is it coming from? It can't be the north south one. I'm I'm confused. Well, that's right. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I guess what it is, it, it it's coal coming from from. Uh, Southern Virginia. Southern Southern West Virginia and Fairmont. Yeah, area. exactly. So both of those lines can are are no. going to coal areas. Well, B and O is always kind of east right. west I and then spread that out. Part. And so it would go towards Norfolk, and then you you pick up these ships. Yeah. That mm -hmm. will then take it. Okay. 
I was surprised to see so much coal still being shipped. I, but, but I had no idea. There's a, um, an area off of 695. If you go 64 east towards Hampton Roads, and then you take 664, you'll go right by um, oh, yeah. all I've the... Seen that. Yeah, it's a huge yeah. pile of coal. Yeah. And then if you look like to your left, you see all the battleships from the Navy Yard. Right. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, the Newport News area. Exactly. Hmm. So I think that's great. Uh, it's great talking to you. Um, it's an interesting place. And here, let me let me show everybody Albion's. I already showed them that. Didn't I? Thank you. Well, it's fun. And, and he said, I'm going to write two more like this. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did win a Pulitzer. So, can, one other thing. I, I, I'd like to do this and you can. You notice how I really showed you something special about George Washington, who he is, right? Uh, that story about, and I got that from David Hackett Fisher from an interview about the. He, he was so fear. he said he really understood the idea of the policy of prisoners and human rights. He really did. But let me, if I may, I read of Chernow's book and all that. I'd like to give you two other little snapshots, that tell, three that, if you're interested, that really say something about George. Is that okay? Or please, you, if you want to say something? Want to hear? Well, I, okay. um, I've read um, more than once that what formed George's character was the hundred rules of society, I know. which a Jesuit priest wrote from the 16th French Jesuit. I put them on Facebook. He wrote that in 1600. And then George learned about it in school and memorized it and uh, used it all of his life. I, I totally, do you know about this, everyone? It's called, what, 119? rules for being a gentleman or something? Have you ever heard of that? Well, what, what Al is saying, this, this is like, oh my gosh, the very, very last one to paraphrase, keep forever alive in your bosom the celestial fire of conscience. Keep forever alive in your bosom the celestial fire of conscience, young man. It's already there. He's already got it, got the, and then these trials brought it conscious, made it conscious. And, you know, I, I was just used to seeing him as being a marble man. If you know Walter Washington, oh my God, he just, I knew John Washington, the family historian, they're both related to George on two lines. But Walter has it. If you've ever talked to him, it's he, his idea of getting angry is like quietly exploding. <laughs> He's got, he's got, he's got George. Looks like he looks like him and the other stone. And George, he has that discretion. He has that not talking very much. I'm with Walter in the deed room. And he says, I've known him for many, many years. And he goes, those, those, he's not happy about the condition of Claymont. And he goes, those people of Claymont Whatever. <laughs> That's called a fury for Walter. <laughs> but he's such a, you know, he's a natural gentleman, but he's, he's got that. When I, there's one painting by George, of George, where he's kind of looking at the side. I'm, oh my God, I've seen that look exactly in Walter. When he's thinking, he has this kind of, anyway. We see, see George as this guy who's always like this. When they arrived with his, his man, his tough frontiersman in the Boston area, maybe still Cambridge, there, of course, there begins a row with a local tough guy. You know how it is. Words, hotter, hotter, and hotter. And these two guys are just really, you know, and then they're their guys and his guys, and they're starting to push. Washington gallops up, throws his reins again to Billy Lee, comes, up, comes over to the two guys, he grabs it by the nape of the neck and goes, that is George Washington. Because we're so used to him being so like this, but he's like, 
<laughs> he was a big physical man. He was a big man. He, for his time, like in some respects, like Lincoln, who was also very big physical. Exactly. Washington was a physical specimen. He was a big guy. Yeah, that's interesting. And they always said Jefferson said he's the best horseman in Virginia. And if you look at it, he is either riding or riding around his property most of the time. He should not have come home that night where he got pneumonia. He'd been in the rain. Mm -hmm. He should have yeah, been some unexpected guests. The worst thing is sitting in cold, wet, wet clothes, right? Are you talking about Washington? Washington. It's like Washington. he was dead. Yes? Oh, no. Okay. Well, remember, he, he's such a gentleman. He's not going to say, I can't stay. And he got, got cold. Same similar thing with FDR. He, he was swam in the cold. And Okay, but that's image number two. Uh, his men had gone through Valley Forge and 2,500 2, died from all these terrible things that they did. And he still had men. When, sp when spring came, they were so ready for a fight. <laughs> they were so, they wanted a battle. And Charles Lee, this is Monmouth. Charles Lee, uh, he's that little, little cadre of George Mason and Horatio Gates and Charles Lee, Adam Stephen. They're all, all older than him, and for their whole lives, they've been trying to put him down. <laughs> and they all hate the fact that he sort of came up, matched them, and passed them. They just cannot get over that. So Charles Lee leading him to Monmouth. They want to fight so bad. And Charles Lee, for no explic explicit reason, says retreat. And Washington sees them coming back, and they're, they are not. And this is what I love. You know what Valley Forge is. Like. You know how much they wanted to fight. When Charles Lee got to Washington, somebody said, profanity fell from his mouth like leaves. <laughs> He's, and then one guy said, they are all shocked because they've never, ever seen that before. And like, like Lee was like reduced to a little scared puppy. Well, that's the end of that. He's fired. Each one of them got yanked at one point or another. There's an old famous story where Horatio Gates, Adam Stephen, and Lee are all having a drink. And, and one said, I was fired because I didn't go forward. You were fired because you went forward when you should have gone back. And you were fired because you went back and you should have gone forward. Okay, the last one on Lee, I mean, Washington. This is <laughs> farewell address. We all know the farewell address, the words. And think, you know, by the way, think of how we have the State of the Union when everybody's shaking hands and it's all this intensity and media and cameras. And, you know, it has a, when they approach the speech. George is worried about his teeth. He never talked too much because he was afraid they'd pop out. Honestly. George comes into the capital, into, that, into the room. There's, of course, crowds outside and crowds inside. And he gives his simple speech. He comes in alone. And then when he's done, and he, he walks out. He walks down the street, and he gets a good ways, alone, and then he hears some kind of commotion behind him. And there are thousands of people that just dare not get any closer, but they did not want to see him go. Hmm. That incredible. So we have, you know, we have to, re it's hard to understand there was someone like that. But, you know, and of course he was touched. He says, okay, cool. Because cool. all his life, I can't wait to get back to Mount Vernon. Those are my three stories. <laughs>